Hello, welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and this week we have Lesson 11, looking at the sunrise and sunset peoples of East Texas and Southwest Louisiana's Gulf Coast, the Atacapa Ishaq. The Texas Gulf Coast itself is 367 miles long. But if you count all the tidal pools and inlets and outs and some bends and curves, it gets up to 3,359 miles. Now, as we've seen in previous lessons, some Coatecon bands occupied the far southern coast in deep south Texas. And the Karankawas lived from south Texas to the area of Galveston Island. The distance from Galveston Bay to the Texas border with Louisiana is about 101 miles, and it was home to the Ishak, the people, known to us as the Atacapas, a name given them by their eastern neighbors, the Choctaw. We'll look at that a little bit greater detail in just a second. The Tonkawas lived to the west, the Caddos lived to the north, and directly to the east in Louisiana, they were neighbors with the Chitimaca people, a, a people that some scholars are starting to think might actually have been related to them in some way. A very interesting fact about the Ishak or the Atacapa is that unlike many of the other indigenous groups of Texas, they did not have an origin story from where they emerged from a hole in the ground. No, they came from the sea, having been cast up on an oyster shell according to a couple of sources I've read. Then they arrived at their home where they lived along the Gulf of Mexico's northwestern crescent and in the dense forests of southeast Texas and southwest Louisiana. In Texas, they lived along the Sabine, Neches, Sed- Jacinto, Trinity Rivers, and the eastern part of Galveston Bay. They stretched from present-day Vermilion Bay, Louisiana, to Galveston. At some point, they suffered a severe deluge that became a part of their memory. They remembered that it covered all the land except for the very tallest hills. In ancient times, they said, they divided into the Sunrise People and the Sunset People. This is apparently a reference to the Louisiana Ishak as the Sunrise People and the more west and southerly along the coast Ishak of Texas as the Sunset People. I originally was going to record about them when I did my episode on the Karankawas. And unfortunately, I didn't because that was such an involved episode that I decided to put it off. But we're doing it today. They weren't very advanced agriculturally, perhaps planting a few gardens with varieties of maize. So mostly they relied on hunting and gathering What did they hunt? They hunted everything like everybody else did, but they specifically uh, would focus on deer, alligators, bison, along with an assortment of other animals. And they fed off of the wonderful resources of the rivers and the Gulf Coast, like the Karankawas did. Shellfish, fish, everything that could be gathered and harvested from the rivers and the the bays and the, the Gulf itself. As we will see in greater detail when we take a look at the Caddo, there was a great Mississippian culture that had far-reaching influence, including that of building mounds and monuments out of earthworks. The Ishak built mounds for their leaders and holy men to live on. And personally, I wonder if part of this is also tied to the story of the Great Flood that they needed to have places of refuge on higher ground. Just a thought. For many Atacapa Ishak, the alligator was very important. They provided not only meat for food, but also oil for cooking, and was used to treat minor arthritis and eczema symptoms. Alligator scales were said to even be used as arrowheads. And alligator oil also helped repel mosquitoes by smearing it all across your body and as you know in texas louisiana mosquitoes are big and they like to bite so i'd I'd take some alligator oil even if it smelled pretty bad sometimes because 
they they love, really love to feast on me personally. As we've seen with other indigenous peoples, they did practice a form of cannibalism, ritual cannibalism, for taking the power of someone else rather than for just for sustenance. And this is where they received the name Atacapa from the Choctaw. Atacapa means eaters of men. And as is usually the case, a name like that is usually what the Europeans would pick up and use because they had learned about the Atacapa from the Choctaw and other peoples that called them this. They spoke the Atacapa language and it's been studied quite a bit. It's odd that we know a lot more about their language than we do about them. But it's one of the better recorded native languages and has fascinated scholars for years. There is still some debate over whether it is a unique linguistic stock or if it might be related to the languages of some other eastern tribes. Some speculate that it goes in relation as far as the Tunicas on the lower Yazoo River near Vicksburg, Mississippi. They weren't many in number, perhaps only 3,500 living in the large area that they had in the late 1600s, but as we've seen, it's impossible to know how many there might have been due to the ravages of European disease. And by the 1900s, they were extremely few in number. The Sunrise people, the Eastern bands, were the... I'm going to try to say this respectfully. I apologize if I get it wrong. The Hiyakiti Ishak, Sunrise people. They lived in present-day parishes of southwestern Louisiana, and there were three major bands. The Sea White, or Alligator Band, again, I apologize if I get that wrong, who lived along the Vermilion River and near Vermilion Bay in southwestern Iberia Parish, the Otzi or Tesh band, the snake band, lived on the prairies and coastal marshes in the Mermentile River watershed around St. Martinsville on Bayou Tesh in present day St. Martin, Lafayette, St. Landry, St. Mary, Acadia, and Evangeline parishes in southern Louisiana. And the Opelousas band, black leg or heron band, painted their lower legs and feet black during their mourning ceremonies, which is why they were called this. It's thought that they did this to mimic the long black legs of the heron. The western bands were the sunset people. He, Kike, Ishak. These bands include the eagle band, also known as the Kalkasu Band because they were living along the Kalkasu River between Kalkasu Lake in southwestern Louisiana and Sabine Lake on the Louisiana-Texas border. Their name was also the Cot Coke Band. The Redbird Band lived on the prairies and coasts of what is now Cameron Parish in southwestern Louisiana. They were represented by the Cardinal or Redbird. The Niel, or Panther Band, lived in the areas around the Sabine River of southeast Texas. And yes, the panther was their totem. The Aco Kisos, which probably means river people, they lived on the lower Trinity and San Jacinto Rivers and on Gallison Bay. And along with the Karankawas, the survivors of the Narvaez expedition that included Cabeza de Vaca, and that crashed into the Gulf of the Gulf Coast of Texas in 1528. They also met the Akokisos when they survived that horrible, horrible shipwreck. The Bidais lived further up the Trinity River around Bidais Creek, and they ranged from the Brazos River to the Neches River in Texas. The Dedosas were a subdivision that broke away from the Bidais. They lived north of the other Bidai, between the confluence of the Angelina River and the Natchez River and the upper end of Galveston Bay in east central Texas. 
they later became closely associated with the Tonkawas. The Patiris lived north of the Akakisas in the Piney Woods, north of San Jacinto River Valley between the Bidai in the north and the Akakisa in the south. Very little is known about them, and in the mid-1700s, they did have four or five villages in that area. Now, all of these loose bands moved within their territories, hunting, gathering, and fishing. They were also adept with bows and arrows, and they were good at maneuvering dugout canoes. They are described and drawn by 18th and 19th century Europeans as short, dark, and stout, wearing breech cloths and buffalo hides. The women wore skin skirts. Polygamy and incest were forbidden. They believed in a creator of all things and taught that all those that do well go above and those that do evil descend under the earth into the shades. If you were bitten by a snake and died, or if you were eaten after you were killed, that meant you could not get into the afterlife also. Now we're going to take a little brief break to thank Age of Radio for hosting Texas History Lessons, and then we'll be right back to look further at the Atacapa Ishak. I'm going to read a little passage from Newcomb's The Indians of Texas to share a little bit of their early contact with Europeans. It begins with, apart from Devaca's possible contact with the Atacapan peoples, there is little other early mention of them. La Salle must have crossed their territory, as also did the Spaniard Alonso de Leon, but neither they nor other 17th century explorers left anything more than passing references to them. The first extensive account of Atacapans, and among the most enthralling of such accounts to be found anywhere, was left by a young French officer, Simars de Belleisle. In 1719, a French ship landed five officers on Galveston Bay to refill its water casks. For some unexplained reason, the peculiar captain failed to pick up his shore party. One by one, four of the men died from starvation. Only the sturdy and determined de Belleisle managed to survive. Several weeks after his last companion had succumbed, de Belleisle, while searching for edible worms, spied some Indians collecting bird eggs on an island. Joining them, he was made captive and stripped of his possessions and clothing. But he was fed. As a captive and an outsider, he was the victim of many indignities. But the natives, who were Akokisas, eventually supplied him with a wife, and from their point of view, provided a servant and quasi-husband for a widow. His account of life with these Indians gives us a fair picture of life on the coast of the 18th century. His tale of escape in 1721 through the intercession of Hesina Caddo's his domestic arrangements with the Hesini woman Angelica and his other experiences comprise an almost unbelievable real-life adventure. We will definitely be looking into his story later. A little bit later, after 1721, when rumors of a French threat were great, as we've seen, the Spanish built the missions of San Francisco Xavier, Nuestra Señora de la Candelario, and San Ildefonso on the San Gabriel River in central Texas near present-day Rockdale, and they did this in 1749. The missions attracted mainly the more inland Atacapans, the Bidais, Dedosas, and also some Aquaquisas from the coast. But as we've seen, the Apache threat really hampered the missions, and they weren't successful and closed in 1755. There were other attempts a little bit a year later, but for the most part, as we'll see when we look closer at the Spanish involvement, they just didn't have a lot of success with these peoples. Today, the Atacapa Ishak are not a federally recognized tribe, but they are working for that recognition. They do not have a reservation on their own government or their own government, but they do have tribal communities and continue to practice their culture. As they say on their website, they've been called Creoles, Creole Indians, and Creoles of color. They prefer Ishak. According to the Atacapa Ishak website, many Atacapa Ishak no longer know their correct racial identity. This is more than likely due to extensive intermarriage with black, white, Hispanic citizens. They claim to be the source of Tasso, a smoked, spiced, and cured meat that is a specialty of South Louisiana cuisine. 
and they claim to be the originator of Cajun oyster pie. It is also possible that the name of Zydeco, a music genre that evolved in southwest Louisiana by French Creole speakers, and it blends blues, rhythm, and blues, and music indigenous to the Louisiana Creoles and to the Native American people of Louisiana. It's very possible that Zydeco came from a couple of words in the Atacapan language. Modern Atacapa Ishak have served in the United States military, and others have become talented, industrious, self-sustaining professionals in many areas. Dr. Wilbert Lamel of New Iberia, Louisiana, served as President Jimmy Carter's ambassador to Kenya and the Seychelles. I want to thank Josh from the Bloody Beaver podcast for reminding me to do this. And as you can see, pretty much while they were distinct people, they lived an extremely similar lifestyle to the Karankawas, which is why I had it originally intended to bundle them together, but I'm glad I didn't because they deserved their own episode, their own focus, and their own story. We will be talking more about them in greater detail once we start getting into the European and Native Indigenous peoples' interactions upon the arrival of the people from across the sea and attempts at settlement and trade. So I want to thank everybody for listening. You want to know more about the Atacapa Ishak and their efforts to become a recognized tribe go to their website I'll put a link in the show notes um, please remember to reach out and uh, let me know if there's anything you'd like to hear about I just have had a couple of really good recommendations in the past couple of weeks from some listeners that I'm pursuing it's going to take a while because as you see it, it, I'm kind of slow about getting these together lately. Things have been very busy, but I'm working hard and hopefully soon we'll get to the Caddo's and we'll get on from there and start looking at the arrival of the Europeans. I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank my patrons. I want to thank Jay, Ron, Kay, everybody that listens, everybody that has given me positive feedback. It's really appreciated. You can email the show at Texas History Lessons at gmail.com we're on twitter at texas history l texture history lessons just look it up on twitter it'll pop up and uh, you know what leave a rating i've had some really nice ratings left on itunes um, by some people and i uh, really appreciate it that goes a long ways that's a that's a, that really helps the show again until next time i'm michael thanks for listening <laughs>